Hello everyone and welcome to the 21st edition of the India Today Conclave. It's an absolute delight and pleasure to have all of you with us. Can we have a round of applause as you welcome our Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman. The theme of this year's conclave is India's rapidly changing position in the emerging global order. And central to that is the strength of the Indian economy. The International Monetary Fund has projected, and I have a slide that's coming up behind your screen, that India could be a $6.9 trillion economy by 2028. What's the unfinished reform agenda? What more do we need to do to move with the maximum speed and purpose possible? And what are the pitfalls that can derail us along the way? To talk about this, we are kicking off the first session at this year's conclave with our finance minister, who now is one of India's most experienced finance ministers. And at this moment, the odds-on favorite to present a seventh budget in July, potentially. So, Nirmala Sitaramanji, welcome to the conclave, and it's an absolute pleasure to have you. I also want to welcome my colleagues and co-moderators for this session, Anjana Kashyap, Aksdak, star anchor and editor, and also Siddharth Zarabi, the managing editor of Business Today Television. So, welcome. Let's get started. Ma'am, can you begin by outlining the unfinished reform agenda? To achieve that kind of growth from where we are right now, if your government gets another chance, what more do you believe needs to be done beyond the reform measures that you've already put in place for India to unlock its true potential and rise and grow at the maximum speed possible? Thank you, India, today for having me over. And uh, I thought uh, Rahul's uh, comment about most experience was a bit tongue-in-cheek. He, he comes out as somebody who doesn't believe in it himself. But never mind. I'll allow that. Um, in no order of priority, the right, kind of reforms which we need to undertake now, I would think, in whichever sector you would want to take it, will have to have greater coordination between the center, the states, and the urban local bodies, panchayats, and so on. In the last 10 years, my experience, at least limited to my experience, I can tell you, you may do wonderful um, futuristic reforms at the central government level. And most states understand that it benefits them as well. And they do also, uh, in synchrony, do things which are going to help both center and states. And it is only when you touch that layer, the third layer, you find many of them are almost getting blocked in the sense it's not an intentional block. It's more a question of they understanding what it can do for them and also trying to make sure that they can uh, easily slip into that process so that up from the central government down to the panchayat, because after all, when industries set up their businesses, they have to set it up in the ground in, in the, at the panchayat level. So if all those great reforms are happening elsewhere and it's not really borne out in the panchayat level, it's not going to help at all. So there has to be a lot of work done from top level in the sense of center, state, and the third level, uh, you know, elected governments. So that is one thing, I think, across the sectors. When you undertake reforms, it has to have that effect of cascading down to the uh, lowest level. You know, the finance minister felt maybe that that comment was tongue-in-cheek. It was. It's an I knew you were going to come back of on fact. That. And she is indeed one of India's most uh, experienced finance ministers now and in very august company. And truly, without tongue being in cheek and just stating the fact for is the odds-on favorite to be back in July. Both of those are Thank absolute you. statements of fact. She's just being humble and modest. And that's just the way she is. On the tricky aspects of reform, so the government tried to deal with uh, land reform. The government tried to deal with agricultural reform. Both occasions, the government and the prime minister ended up burning their hands and backtracked. GST reform again has been an area where put, uh, progress hasn't been made beyond where we've reached. Do you think those are areas that you have a philosophy or a framework to be able to navigate, or will they remain just political hot potatoes? Um, with due respects to those who protested on those, I would like to say those bills, when passed in the parliament, 
you can have a thousand commentary on it saying could the debate in the Rajya Sabha be held for one extra hour, it would have brought in more speakers. You can nitpick on those things. But they were the very reforms that when in power, those governments, those ministers who held power at that time, were all watching for. They wanted the agriculture reform. They wanted the land reform, labor codes. These are things when people wanted it, they spoke very much about it. Records in the parliament show it. But when you politically conveniently sitting in the opposition protest against every one of this, your hypocrisy is what, get, what is getting exposed. And as much as this election, 2024 Lok Sabha, people see a delivering government, a visionary prime minister, and many other things which this government has done, I think they are also seeing how hypocritical in protesting against every good measure this government took was the current opposition. People are seeing that as well. So if the environment is building up for Prime Minister to come back, it's, become, it's, coming, it's getting built up on the one hand, two-thirds on what the government has done and the vision with which this government is functioning, and at least a third goes to those hypocrites who wasted the parliament's time. And people are realizing, we have not sent them there for it. Hypocrites who spoke in favor of some policies who are speaking against it now. So it is a blend of a hypocritical opposition which has got exposed and the fantastic work which Prime Minister has done during most difficult time with transparency. Ten years, every journalist, I'm sure, searched for at least one little straw of corruption. You couldn't find one. Anjana. Huh. वित्त मंत्री जी जब प्रधानमंत्री ने सबसे पहली बार तीसरे टर्म की बात की तो वो ऐसे ही हॉल में बैठे थे जहां बहुत बड़े बड़े बिजनेस टाइकून्स बैठे हुए थे और उसका सारा का सारा बोझ आपके कंधों पर डाल दिया क्योंकि उन्होंने कहा कि तीसरी सबसे बड़ी अर्थव्यवस्था हम अपने देश को बनाएंगे तीन का टारगेट भी दे दिया है तो तीन बहुत ज्यादा है जो आपको मैनेज करने हैं लेकिन सवाल आता है कि क्या आप ये चुनौती देखती है आरबीआई से लेकर प्रधानमंत्री सबने रेवड़ियों पर बहुत कंसर्न जताया यहां तक आरबीआई ने कहा कि परिस्थितियां कई राज्यों में राजस्थान पश्चिम बंगाल बहुत खराब है इसको रोकना जरूरी है लेकिन जो एक पार्टी के लिए रेवड़ी है वो आपकी पार्टी तक आते आते सोशल वेलफेयर स्कीम कल्याणकारी स्कीम बन जाती है क्या ये मापदंड सही है और इसी प्रश्न का दूसरा हिस्सा है कि क्या अर्थव्यवस्था को तीसरी सबसे बड़ी अर्थव्यवस्था बनाने में बतौर वित्त मंत्री आपको ये सबसे बड़ी चुनौती नहीं लगती है जो चुनावी वक्त में भी सारे एक के बाद एक इतने पैसे देंगे इतने फ्री बस राइड्स देंगे जो फ्री बीज जैसे हम कहते हैं सभी पार्टियां ऐलान कर रही है अंजना जी योर एज यूजल ट्राइंग एंड आई एम गोइंग टू डू इट इन इंग्लिश आई ट्राई टू स्पीक इन हिंदी बट आई लूज माई थॉट फ्लो बिकॉज यू नो आई बी सर्चिंग फॉर वर्ड्स इन हिंदी यू एज यूजल एंड एज इज टिपिकल विद मीडिया एंड आई डोंट ब्लेम यू फॉर इट यू डू दिस बैलेंसिंग एक्ट what is ravdi for you is not ravdi for them come on you do not have a budgetary support for some fantastic idea that you throw about and then once you get the vote you don't have money to fund that and then you go about blaming the central government which is not sought vote with you for the same ravdi but you want the central government to fund you because you had these fancy baskets of lollipops given for the people. Look at the example, and I'm sitting here to talk politics. Look at the example of Karnataka. A state one year ago was doing very well. Global Investor Summit drew the best of people to come and invest in that state because it's a fantastic state, draws excellent talent from all over the country, beautifully endowed, and has the right environment of blend of culture, industry, enterprise, and everything else. Now, what is the state of affairs in Karnataka? And who is to blame? And it, it actually hurts me so much to say, even Bengaluru city doesn't have drinking water. All within a year, you, you've seen what a ravidi can do. And now you want center to fund your ravidi? And you blame saying center is discriminating? And there is also another state which has taken us to the court. And I'm quite happy to go to the court and put all the facts before the court. For the mismanagement that states do, 
I would want the media to ask more meaningful questions of those states as well. Stop this debate of balancing. What is revenue for you is not revenue. Come on, tell me. Ask them to show the budgetary statements to say, I have made provision for this particular thing, so I don't need newer taxes on my own people. I've made budgetary provision for this. I will not blame the government if it doesn't give me one paisa extra than what the Finance Commission has asked me for. Ask such questions, Anjana. Then you'll know what is ravery and what is not. Uh, <laughs> Finance Minister, I want to follow this question up uh, with a broader point about the north-south divide. Uh, fastest growing economy in the G20 nations, faster than any of our uh, rivals. Fourth largest stock market, which is turbocharged right now. But do you think the north-south divide is a crucial uh, concern that will escalate during the election uh, campaigning? Yeah, obviously, because they want to ex escalate it because it can keep the narrative going in the direction in which they want uh, the narrative to go. But matter of fact, this has been one of those pet themes of state-level parties which think it's good to hit at the center and nobody from the center can come and defend themselves in that state, for instance. So when you have this debate going, I grew up in a Tamil Nadu, which I've heard, even with the Congress party in power in the center, and subsequently, every time there was an alliance with the uh, state party, Congress party was an alliance. Even then, I've heard comments like, Vadakku Varudu Terku meaning North prospers and South is Teyid is ragad ragad karke kuch hota hai. You become thinner and uh, paler and everything. Yes, sir. So this kind of a narrative I've heard even Tamil Nadu, even when center was ruled by Congress party. It's a typical um, political narrative, which particularly the Dravidian parties, particularly the DMK, has always used to give an impression that center is not doing its due to the state. And none of the ministers in the center, even one or two of them who are from Tamil Nadu themselves, would take it upon themselves to go and defend the center I would want to believe the center did not discriminate the states even then and even now. But ministers who are part of the central government even at that time, alliance partners of the party DMK, wouldn't go to Tamil Nadu and take the pains to say no center doesn't discriminate. So that narrative happily found traction. But today, no, sorry, each one of us go there to say what we are doing and therefore there are friction points in the narrative. So that is a typical Dravidian political narrative which believes in showing this country as being different in the south and the north being ruled by mostly or largely by non-Tamil or non-South Indian language speaking people in power, so it sells as an argument. But that's not fair at all. Madam Finance Minister, as we look back at the 10 years of the Modi Sarkar, on the economic report card, there are areas of strength and achievements, and then there are some concerns. I want to draw your attention to two visualizations compiled by the India Today Data Intelligence Unit and get you to comment on your strategy to deal with these. These are economic realities. I want to understand how you're dealing with them. I'll take uh, shrinking consumer spending first. So on your screen coming up is a visualization that maps uh, consumer spending going back to two decades. So if you see, uh, consumer spending over the last couple of years has actually come down uh, to levels below where we were a couple of decades ago. Do you see this as being normal? There's a lot of concern in some economic circles that consumer spending is going down and why and whether beyond the big headline economic growth numbers, there is underlying stress. So that's one. The second is to do with household savings. So if you call up the visualization on household savings, here as well, uh, there is some concern in terms of whether household saving, which has really been one of the strengths of the Indian economy, because Indians, unlike more profligate consumers in the West, tend to save more, whether that is changing and whether that, again, at some level, uh, is representative of economic stress. So if you look at those, I'm sure you've had an opportunity to absorb what the trend lines are suggesting. 
So, Madam Finance Minister, your sense on the concern that behind the growth numbers is an underlying stress reflected and captured in these charts? I'll first take on the household savings. Yes, the number which is shown is based on savings, small savings. And there are very many schemes through which we are trying to capture with better interest rates, like the one which we gave in honor of women. We said, you, uh, you take up a fixed deposit before the uh, 31st of March 2024, you get a higher rate of interest. And many women have started uh, investing money into the fixed deposit because the rate of interest was much higher than what otherwise the banks would give. Uh, so by doing this uh, where the interest rate was remaining low for a long time and people didn't think it was worth putting money into the small savings schemes or the banks, we had to prop that up with specified targets with higher interest rate, which means we are subsidizing. But what is also equally happening and which doesn't get captured in this is people today, when I say people, retail, small people, are also going to the stock markets. Not just going through mutual funds, but also going through DMAT accounts which they open on their own. So the, actually since after 2020, you find that money is going to the stock market in the name of retail investments have gone substantially high. In fact, India stands out as one of those countries where retail investors are directly going to stock market. And that should also get ca captured and not seen as speculation. It's certainly investing their savings into stock market rather than putting into savings schemes. That's about savings. Uh, if you talk about consumption, there, there can be a disparity and that will be a matter of my worry so that I can um, see how best I can help out in consumption expenditure. But consumption expenditure also depends on the items which go into the basket. And when you talk to the fast moving uh, goods which are reaching out the rural areas, there are dips and rises, but people are spending on goods which are cons consumer durables as much as they used to do when days were not affected by COVID earlier. So I, I think what is important for us to is to see how in the medium term it pans out rather than get carried away by month on month expenditure analysis. It is important to know because you'll get to seeing how it's moving, but I would be uh, looking at both with a larger screen before me. My question is also related to the cost of spending and the cost of people's money. We talk about the cost of people's money. When there were five countries, the price of the cylinder was reduced to 200 rupees. And now it's reduced to 100 rupees. And in the evening, it's reduced to 200 rupees of petrol and diesel. Now, the people are saying that this is a cost of money. When the time of the election comes, the cost of the cost of the cost of the cost. वो सही बात नहीं है क्योंकि नवंबर 21 में और उसके बाद जून 22 में फ्यूल का एक्साइज ड्यूटी कटाया गया और सिलेंडर का इससे पहले अभी 100 रुपया के बाद आप कर रहे हैं इससे पहले 200 का कटाउती हुई 200 प्लस 100 पुट टुगेदर आज उज्ज्वला कंस्यूमर्स के लिए जो लोअर एंड का कंस्यूमर्स है उनके लिए 300 � so, चुनाव के बहाना हो, उसके बाद हो, उसके पहले हो, आम जनता के लिए जो हम करना है, हम करते जा रहे हैं लगातार। आप चुनाव के मध्य नजर रखते हुए आप प्रश्न पूछ रहे हैं, मैं पूछ रही हूँ, बहुत सारे स्टेट्स हैं, जब हम रिड्यूस किए, उन्होंने रिड्यूस नहीं किए, और उनके इलेक्शन मैनिफेस्टो में प्रॉमिस प्रॉमिस को भी माना नहीं है, चुनाव को भी माना नहीं है, कभी खाटा भी नहीं है। सो प्रश्न हम से उठाना है या उनसे उठाना है, हम कुछ ना कुछ बहाना दिखे दिखाते हुए, चाहे वो इलेक्शन भी क्यों ना हो, हम खट तो कर रहे हैं। मैं पूछ रही हूँ उन लोगों से जो मैनिफेस्टो में लिखे हैं और उस समय भी नहीं किया फिर भी जीतने के बाद काम तो नहीं कर रहे
Finance Minister, you mentioned the stock markets and the uh, and the growing uh, stock market uh, equity investing cult. But my question is, do you see any excesses building up uh, in the economy? Are certain areas of our economy getting overheated? The regulators seem to be a little concerned. They have expressed public warnings, froth in the market, valuation bubbles, unsecured lending. As the Finance Minister of India, what is your view on this? I'll allow the markets to play on their own. Because as much as all of us can observe that our stocks are overvalued or our stocks don't represent the real value, whatever be it, I think the markets will play it out. And uh, we should leave it to the wisdom of the market because all of us have seen that despite huge fluctuations globally, Indian market has maintained a certain level of sanity. It hasn't really gone too uh, violent this way or that way. So I'll place a lot of trust on the market. Madam Finance Minister, you know, I want to talk to you about two things. If you look at the overall numbers for foreign direct investment and foreign portfolio investment, the numbers show that we're at historic levels or we're doing much better than in the past. However, many economists would argue that that's not the full picture, that the right way of looking at this, and again, I want to call two visualizations on the screen, the right way of looking at this is to look at foreign direct investment and foreign portfolio investment relative to our GDP. So if we were to do that conversion and have these on our screen right now, so just so that everyone's on the same page, the light cream represents foreign direct investments, where in 2001, if foreign direct investment was about 0.9% of the size of the GDP as a percentage, it's now 0.7. So it went up in 2010 and has been a flatline curve tending downwards uh, till the last numbers are available for Q3 of uh, the last year. So that's foreign direct investment. Foreign portfolio investments, which come into the markets, again, is a zigzag flatline curve, not really tending upwards as a percentage of the GDP. They're saying, naturally, if the size of the economy keeps increasing, you look at the overall numbers, that looks very impressive, but convert it back into a percentage of the GDP, and then the numbers tell their own picture. So here, we've gone up from 0 0.6 to 1.3, but whether that is enough, optimal, and what more can be done? So how do you look at these numbers, the foreign attraction to India relative to the size of the current GDP? Madam Finance Minister. Um, they are very important indicators, no doubt. We'll also have to place them in the context. That is, whether the Indian market, Indian economy, the macro economy, are all attractive enough for foreign direct investment to come. And whether for the FPIs, which are a lot more mercurial in their functioning, whether there's enough for them to earn. But that is looking at the one side of the coin, that is the Indian macroeconomic situation. But you'll also have to look at the global situation, whether the fund is ready to come here, or are there attractive markets outside? Despite that, if they have to come, what are the kind of things we need to do? So when the question is asked as to what the government has to do to keep FDI consistently coming to India, you'll have to every time pitch that picture against what is developing globally. So if the global um, situation is strong, you will have to do a lot more to attract them. And if the volatility is much more there, then you know that you will naturally project your macroeconomic situation being stable and attract them. I'm telling you the larger principle. But off late, India's macroeconomic consistency has been strong and that is why you find FDIs coming in. Discussions with fund managers, discussion with sovereign funds, all of whom come to India to ask as to what is it that they can get in into, which are the kinds of areas and so on. So yes, the map is important, but I would think the interest in investments coming into India is at its one of the peak, peak moments, I would think, because off late, at least in the last five to six months, We've had quite a few funds coming to India to say, we are very impressed, we want to continue to be here, or we want to expand. So I would look at that as a very strong indicator that this picture will only improve and keep growing. 
विदेशी निवेश की आपने चर्चा की लेकिन देश के अंदर जो चर्चा होती है वो सबसे ज्यादा नौकरियों को लेकर है और चुनावी वर्ष मोदी सरकार बनने के बाद 2014 से लगभग 2021-22 तक सात लाख के आसपास सरकारी नौकरियां दी गई थी और उसके बाद से पिछले 18 महीनों में चूंकि फोकस बहुत नौकरियों पर आया आठ लाख से ज्यादा सरकारी नौकरियां दी गई आपकी सरकार दावा करती है कि मुद्रा लोन बहुत दे रहे हैं उससे हम रोजगार के साधन लोगों को प्रोवाइड कर रहे हैं फिर वो इंटर्न आगे लोगों को देंगे लेकिन विपक्ष इस बात पर घेरता है लगभग जो सरकारी आंकड़ा है कहता है साढ़े नौ से दस लाख सरकारी नौकरियां अभी भी रिक्त हैं राहुल गांधी कहते हैं कि तीस लाख सरकारी नौकरियां रिक्त हैं हम सरकार में आते ही वो देंगे वो राइट टू अप्रेंटिसशिप लॉ भी लाना चाह रहे हैं जिसमें वो एक लाख युवाओं को देंगे और लगभग साढ़े आठ हजार महीने ऐसे में ये कितना बड़ा चैलेंज है आपके लिए क्योंकि बेरोजगारी एक मुद्दा है जिस पर विपक्ष आपको बार बार घेरता है विपक्ष जो बार बार कह रहे हैं उनके लिए मैं एक प्रश्न उठाना चाहती हूँ जब वो राजस्थान में सरकार में थे मध्य प्रदेश में थे छत्तीसगढ़ में थे अभी कर्नाटका में भी हैं, हिमाचल में भी हैं, एक पायलट तो दिखाना चाहिए जैसे हिंदी में आप बोलते हैं जलक दिखाओ भाई फिर लोकसभा में हम वोट देंगे आपको कहीं कुछ नहीं करते हैं घूमते रहते हैं भारत को ये जोड़ो भारत को न्याय दिलाओ भारत को अरे भैया प्लीज इतना भी स्कैटर्ड मन के साथ ना घूमो भाई एक जगह बैठो प्लान करो व्हाट डू यू थिंक मैडम ऑफ द राइट टू अप्रेंटिसशिप एक्ट दिस इज वन ऑफ कांग्रेस इज बिग प्रोमिस दे से लाइक वी ब्रॉट मनरेगा लाइक वी ब्रॉट द फूड सिक्योरिटी एक्ट वी नाउ इंटेंड टू ब्रिंग द राइट टू अप्रेंटिसशिप एक्ट गिवन दैट अनएम्प्लॉयमेंट इज वन ऑफ द बिग चैलेंजेस एनी गवर्नमेंट फेसिस is this a workable solution what do you think of it as finance i want to ask of you rahul only when you think you have to have a right to so and so in the parliament passed is the world going to change right to food act right to the sac right no one is against rights please to ask but are you even empowered to ask for your rights so would you want to place emphasis on empowering people give them the basic facilities across the board for everybody once you bring this right and once you don't implement it which is what they did they brought all the right and kept crowing about it tell me how ineffectively they used manrega atrocious accounts came out of their time manrega being implemented and now when it is being properly implemented particularly because of the context we covid for instance they mock at you saying ha ah, there you go we brought the act and you don't even give us credit but you are using it re extreme once in a hundred year kind of a situation you use that it becomes a uh, you know blue book every time you want to quote when you give them enough support to empower them and they are in a position to do their own and i was very glad to hear mr puri talk about dignity and not talk about poverty what does that mean yes talk about poverty deliver on removing people from poverty but do it with dignity intact i was so glad to hear that and that's what empowering is all about and that is exactly what prime minister modi has done give houses for everybody who's in that you know below poverty line make sure they don't have to run helter skelter use technology to say wherever they are they can get their food quota and so on so right to skilling isn't that what government is doing today skilling is happening all over the country not just for you know those usual skills lathe machine chalao sewing machine chalao papad banao no even on ai even to use technology imagine the rural environment today and all of us talk about women women's rights sorry rahul i'll have to take a minute on this who is being trained to use drones in the villages and for all of us who speak about gender justice and for all of us who want more women's participation in labor force what is prime minister modi doing to the women in the villages they are the ones who are going to operate the drones and what drones which are going to uh, spray um, fertilizer 
which are going to measure the extent of uh, the land cultivating a certain particular crop, which is also going to look at aerially what is the health of the crop. In rural India, for women to hold those instruments and go about doing these jobs, does it have a big impact on the mindset itself? So you're doing things making sure that you will ensure people are trained for skills. What is this Vishwakarma Yojana? Where people who are doing their jobs with bare hands or with minimum tools, you're giving them better market access, better training them, better modern equipments, and making sure that they will get a toolkit worth 15,000 rupees, 500 rupees during the skilling, no rights act business, 500 rupees per day during the training uh, session. So you, you are able to see what impact this Vishwakarma is happening, uh, is having on the ground, and then now say, no, no, I'm bringing a right for it. No right in the parliament, no passing of any law, it's happening in the ground. Let's talk about delivering things. We put everything in the right bracket and never delivered. And we can always speak about, I have given the right, but you have not delivered. Before she became finance minister, Nirmala Sitaraman, I'm sure most of you remember, used to be a highly pugnacious spokesperson of the Bharati Janta Party. As finance minister, she puts on a more sophisticated uh, financial avatar. It's at moments like these <laughs> that uh, the political... The political boxes, the gloves come on and then she's throwing some political punches. So, thank you for that. Uh, Madam Finance Minister. I'm ensuring by saying a thank you that I don't come up with one more on him. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Finance Minister, recently we got to know the identity of the donors in the electoral bonds. And as I was scrutinizing the list, there are a couple of questions that I'm sure are in the minds of everyone here. A, the fact that the BJP gets the large majority of the funding, which can be partly explained by the fact that you're the party in power and everybody wants to be with whoever they think can win. But there are two other questions. One, that the country's major corporate groups, and I don't want to name any one or two, but the big funders who you'd imagine are the ones who are spending their money because it's now through white channels, are not on that list. They're not amongst the major donors, and I'm wondering, okay, if those guys are funding, how is that money coming, and how are they funding, and why is it not through white channels? The second question, Madam Finance Minister, is this, that out of the 30 top funders, 14 corporates had some kind of investigative agency chasing them for some case, which would lead everyone sitting here to wonder whether this is some kind of a buy yourself some protection. If these agencies are chasing you, fund through the electoral bond route in the hope that you can buy yourself some protection. Now, the Modi government's promise was, we will not let this happen. No way, no crony capitalism. And yet the data seems to be telling a story which leads to many questions, Madam Finance Minister. I think you've based yourself on huge assumptions that the money is given after the ED raid happened. For all you know, the money was given earlier. And in spite of that, we went knocking at their doors. Am I making sense? No? <laughs> what if the companies gave the money, and after that, we still went and knocked at their doors through ED? Is that a probability or not? That's an assumption which Rahul has made, that ED went and knocked at their doors, they wanted to save themselves, and therefore they came up with the funds. One. Second assumption in that itself is, are you sure that they've given it to BJP? They probably gave it to the regional parties. What makes you assume so many things and build a narrative? The government has given, and the state bank has done its job as per the orders given by the state, uh, Supreme Court. Now you do any hair splitting on it, but do it without assumptions of this nature. ED, and therefore they gave you. But the rest of them didn't, uh, the rest of them have given God knows to who. Which ED sent, was sent to them? And they have also given it. I think, you know, smart, hard-working research will do good rather than lazy journalism. Uh, <laughs> Finance Minister, uh, a, a quick follow-up on this. Uh, one, do you think uh, loss-making firms 
and shell companies should be barred from political funding. And the second question that is related to this is that why is there so much doubt about corporate funding? Don't companies and businesses, if you have a right to vote, we also should be having a sort of right to finance elections of our choice. एक लीडिंग सवाल इससे हिंदी में भी पूछ लेती हूँ आप एक साथ जवाब दे दीजिएगा कि पूरा कॉन्सेप्ट इलेक्टोरल बॉन्ड्स का ये शक पैदा करता है कि राजनीतिक उगाही यानी पॉलिटिकल एक्सटोर्शन का एक सिस्टम हो सकता है आ, किसी भी पार्टी के लिए आई एम नॉट रूलिंग आउट रीजनल पार्टीज और कांग्रेस और बीजेपी एनी किसी के लिए भी पूरा इलेक्टोरल बॉन्ड्स का जो कॉन्सेप्ट ही है वो पोलिटिकल उगाही के लिए मौका देता है क्या ये सही नहीं अंजना जी मैं सिर्फ एक बार विस्तार से ये विषय बोलना चाह रही हूं एंड ऑल्सो एड्रेसिंग योर सिद्धार्थ योर क्वेश्चन इससे पहले क्या था मैं फुली कॉन्शियस हूं कि ये मामला कोर्ट में अभी भी चालू है चल रही है वर्डिक्ट इज कम एस बी आई इज गॉट बी सबमिटिंग इट इज सबमिटेड मगर विषय इसमें एक प्रश्न मेरे मन में आता है क्या इससे पहले जो सिस्टम था वो हंड्रेड परसेंट परफेक्ट था क्या नहीं एंड लेट अस लेट अस जस्ट रिकॉल व्हाट माय प्रेडिसेसर व्हेन ही ब्रॉट दिस इलेक्ट्रल बॉन्ड्स अरुण जेटली जी सेड इज इट उससे बेहतर है भाई कम से कम पैसा जो पार्टियों को चलता है वो अकाउंट के द्वारा चलने दो दैट इज वाई electoral bonds money is going into the accounts from account to party's account so kam se kam jo party tak pahunchta hai paisa koi bhi party kyun na ho wo white pahunchta hai it's not a perfect system but you moved from almost a wild uh, law unto one self kind of a situation where everybody did what they wanted so we moved from that to the system this is certainly not perfect but one bit better now that's not it fine in the wisdom of supreme court they thought this is not the way to go about it sorry all right is se better system aane tak abhi kya hum wapas usi zamane par chale gaye hain ki jo marzi kar sakte hain cash mein do check mein do kuch mein do kuch aur mein do wagaira i am not criticizing the supreme court's judgment but it is an analysis which runs in my mind and i'm sure all of us are thinking about it so a system which was not perfect from a system which was completely imperfect was brought in consciously brought in saying at least one aspect of it will be cleaner well it's not approved by the supreme court all right so therefore अभी हमारा प्रयत्न ये होना चाहिए कम से कम इससे बहुत सारे सीखना लायक है कि अभी जो कानून जब भी होगा होगा कि नहीं होगा आई एम नॉट कॉमेंटिंग ऑन इट इट्स नॉट अ हेडलाइन फॉर राहुल टू से फाइनेंस मिनिस्टर से न्यू गवर्नमेंट देर बी आई एम नॉट सेंग एनी थिंग आई एम ओनली सेंग इफ एट ऑल वेन एवर समथिंग कम्स वी हैव टू इंट्रोड्यूस एलिमेंट्स ऑफ लेसन दैट वी टेकन फ्रॉम दिस to make sure there is a transparency that transparency will have to be progressively better than each earlier system madam finance minister we are coming to the and yeah sorry yes siddharth you are right why not if corporates can fund they can fund but of course under which scheme of things which law all that will have to be worked out nobody is saying no parties cannot be funded but, but loss making and uh, shell huh, company yes there are issues on those sort of things which of course will have to be looked into you can't afford to have shell companies or you know loss making companies that's a very valid point madam finance minister we are coming to the close of the first session of the india today conclave and before we end i have one final question you know when we spoken to you at the peak of the crypto hype you said you don't believe in the crypto asset that this is pure speculation i just want to call this visualization which goes back a few years looks at the crash which is when a lot of people sitting here would have imagined that the crypto story is over this was speculation this is like tulips this was never real and then voila the cockroach bounces back 
Now, when you look at this chart, now more and more serious traders and firms are looking at crypto as an asset, saying if it survived so many falls, there is some underlying resilience, which even if doesn't make sense simplistically, but obviously is there, which is why it's kind of bounced back. And now, given the fact that crypto supply is also coming down, in the context of how market fundamentals are moving at this moment, is that leading the government also potentially to reassess its position on cryptos? Reassess its position. Its position has always been this, that assets created in the name of crypto can be assets for trading, assets for speculation, assets for money making, assets for many other things. We hadn't regulated them then, we haven't regulated them even now, but they cannot be currencies is what I've always held, and that's the government of India position also. Currencies are to be issued with the fiat of the government or the central bank of the day. So that is a different story. So if they're coming back, there's resurgence, that is the asset which is being created for speculation or for trading or for whatever purpose. And it is still unregulated in India. And that is why we thought it fit to raise it in the G20 forum, because as it is so technology driven, and it will have a bearing on cross-border payments and so on. If one country regulates and others don't, it will be an easy way of moving money uh, round tripping or funding drugs or even terrorism and so on. So we wanted to create a kind of a framework by taking it to the level of G20. It has been very well received and I'm sure there will be some framework emerging. With that, ladies and gentlemen, we come to the end of the first session of the India Today Conclave. One of the critiques, frankly, of the state of India's democratic play at this moment is the allegation that ministers in the government don't take tough questions and that journalists don't ask tough questions. I think the first session of the Conclave should whip your appetite and give you the sense that Madam Finance Minister didn't have anything about what to ask, what not to ask, questions that could potentially be asked, were asked, and she answered them, throwing a few punches as bravely as was possible. Thank you very much. We appreciate the candor and we appreciate your presence. Madam Finance Minister, can we have a round of applause for Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman for setting the tone and the stage for this, the 21st edition of the India Today Conclave. Thank you, Nirmala Ji. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, as we raise a warm applause for the Honorable Minister, ma'am, would you stay up on stage for just a minute? Ma'am, ma'am, just one minute, if you could stay up on stage and accept a small token of our appreciation. I'd like to call upon uh, Executive Editor-in-Chief, Vice Chairperson, the India Today Group, Ms. Kali Puri, to come up on stage and present a small token of our appreciation to the Honorable Minister. Ladies and gentlemen, please raise a warm applause for Union Minister, Finance, Corporate Affairs, Nirmala Sitaraman.